I want you to picture something that happened in a recent district board of education meeting near where we live. A man in a QAnon t-shirt walks up to the microphone and introduces himself as LIT, which he tells us stands for Little Indigenous Transsexual. He tells us that critical race theory is about ranking victimhood so that straight, cisgender, white people are always in the wrong. His speech then spirals out of control into this inane rant almost immediately. He tells us that if schools teach critical race theory, students will leave behind their families and communities because they'll question society too much. They'll turn to pedophilic sex traffickers at the Mexican border. He claims that school board members are in the pocket of a shadowy organization trying to push these illogical, liberal, identity-based curricula into the classroom for a quick buck. He finishes by characterizing this issue as a war for your children, and then he yields the rest of his time. The subsequent speakers use all the same talking points, and they're pretty standard when arguing against anti-racism, that racism isn't actually a problem, that Dr. King wouldn't approve, and that anti-racists are the real racists. That wasn't a hypothetical scenario. That's how critical race theory is being understood and talked about in a very normal American school district. And since it's August and another school year is about to start, this fight is going to continue. So we thought we would give you two teachers' perspectives as to what critical race theory is, what it isn't, and what the fight over it is actually about. What is critical race theory? Two teachers' perspective from Rewire. I'm Dan. And I'm Jake, and we're both public high school teachers. If you liked the video, please hit like and subscribe to help us grow. Now, let's move past the straw man and can talking points to describe what critical race theory, or CRT, actually is. Part 1. What is critical race theory? Now, before we can talk about what critical race theory is, we need to define what a theory means in the context we're using it. A critical theory, a literary theory, or academic theory outside of hard sciences really means it's just a lens, a way of looking at something. For example, we took classes as part of our English degrees that focus on feminist theory or post-colonial theory. These classes looked at works of literature, philosophy, and history in terms of how they view women and a world shaped heavily by colonization, respectfully. The lenses are a way to ask critical questions, focus discussions, and think about problems with a specific framework. They aren't monolithic, and when you study them, you primarily focus on the different perspectives within them. Critical race theory is an academic discipline pioneered at Harvard Law School in the 70s and 80s. It is a lens through which you can look at history and government and law with an emphasis on outcomes. Its core idea is put forth really well by Education Week, that race is a social construct and that racism is not merely the product of individual bias or prejudice, but something embedded into legal systems and policies. It says that if something hurts a population based on race or ethnicity, then that outcome is an effect of racism even if no malintent was involved. Now that can be kind of difficult to understand in the abstract, so here's a quick example of what this looks like. On the Navajo Nation in Arizona, the average household income is only $8,000. Banks won't approve loans to build houses on the land because all that land is owned by the United States government and managed by the Navajo tribal government. So if someone defaulted on their loan, there would be no way to repossess that house. This means that people are shut out from building wealth through home ownership and mostly live in mobile homes which depreciate in value over time instead of appreciating like a permanent house. It's the system that keeps people impoverished. Even if there are no racist people operating the system, the system's outcomes still disadvantage one specific ethnic group. So basically, critical race theory is a way to look at how race comes into play in law and economics, and not just in personal interactions. It's a practice, not a subject. It evolves. It considers racism to be something more baked into society than just individual racists hurling slurs at the Little Rock Nine as they integrated schools. But that is way different from how CRT is characterized by its opponents. So let's take a moment to figure out what critical race theory is not. Part two, what critical race theory is not. We'd consider the straw men put forth by CRT opponents to be 
pretty intellectually dishonest, so we're not going to use any straw men here. We're going to refute actual, specific arguments that we've seen against critical race theory. And just to be clear, several of those intentional mischaracterizations are designed to scare parents and families into opposing it. So let's dispel some rumors. Misnomer 1. CRT is about ranking oppression. Critical race theory is not about deciding who is more oppressed based on their identities. Instead, it seeks to acknowledge disparities based on how people have historically been treated. For example, 250 years of chattel slavery, followed by 100 years of Jim Crow discrimination laws, followed by 50 more years of more covert racist structures like housing discrimination and political redistricting, has some level of influence on how a family is able to do things like acquire assets or attend college. If you observe any kind of CRT discussion, you will find that 0% of it is about, I'm more oppressed than you. In fact, a lot of leftist and academic communities find that argument really, really annoying because it only encourages infighting and is ultimately a pointless argument to make. To characterize CRT as something that's about levels of victimhood or to say that the most oppressed person is always right is deeply dishonest. Misnomer 2. CRT is about making white kids feel bad about racism. This seems to be a kind of self-defense sort of argument that you'll see pretty frequently. Many people say, understandably, that since their family never enslaved people or never called anyone the N-word, that they never directly stood in the way of civil rights. And if I'm going to extend an olive branch on this one, yeah, I understand that. I feel you. Our family was just a bunch of potato farmers who didn't arrive in America until after slavery ended and generally avoided questionable organizations and people. But they also didn't really have any barriers to entry. They could get loans for houses and farming equipment, they weren't shut out from the communities because of their race, and they didn't have a language or cultural difference separating them from the other people who settled in that area. Compare that to the Japanese-American farmers who were interned at the Amachi prison camp nearby, trying to farm in a climate that they weren't used to, being told during World War II that they were enemies of the state. Our family really didn't have to deal with any of that. If anything, our family actually benefited from that internment, as our late grandfather said that the Japanese Americans brought irrigation techniques with them that other family farms in the area learned and used. But really, this is a misnomer that attempts to reframe this argument as one about personal grievances. It says, as long as you're not intentionally discriminating, you're all good. Racism isn't your problem. It's a really good scare tactic to get people on the anti-CRT side to make it sound like history class is going to just become how white people are bad or artificially inflating or deflating grades based on a student's race. Once again, CRT is not about how you personally have hurt people of color. It's about systems and outcomes. Instead of saying, you shouldn't be mad at me, Examine what barriers your ancestors had in the pursuit of happiness. Misnomer 3. CRT makes everything about race. Anti-racists are the real racists. Honestly, that line from the Diversity Day episode of The Office rings true here. Pretending racism isn't a problem or that race doesn't exist is just fighting ignorance. With more ignorance. ignorance. Right. You'll likely see someone who's against CRT claim that anti-racists make everything about race and claim that a person's whole life is because of their oppression. And that's actually more racist than a non-racist person, because it implies that a person could never rise above their oppression. This isn't true at all. CRT treats race as a political category, not a biological one. Someone is not held down because of their own traits, but because of how society treats them. Plus, this really just seems to be about stopping the conversation. They don't want to have this discussion, so they'll claim that people who acknowledge race are the real racists, as if racism would just disappear tomorrow if we all stopped talking about it. I think that makes this misnomer more insidious, because it encourages people to actively ignore the problem. If you look at this argument critically, it assumes that racism is actually not a problem, and the people who want to talk about it and make it better are making it a problem. Misnomer 4. CRT is a catch-all term for any progressive movement. Critical race theory is not Black Lives Matter. It's not Pride Month, it's not Socialism, it's not Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. CRT is being conflated with wide swaths of the anti-racism movement and social justice, 
corporate diversity trainings and racial uprising in the summer of 2020, and it's just not. It's a field of study that's sort of related to one of those things in a broader context, but it's not controlled by or part of general progressivism. Regionally, critics of critical race theory have even lumped in programs like Day Without Hate, a local student-led organization that promotes nonviolence, unity, and respect in our schools. After the shootings at Virginia Tech in 2007, students at Stanley Lake High School and Jefferson County Public Schools asked their classmates to wear white in order to show a commitment and trust in each other to make their school a safer place. The effort's been a wild success for years, and only now is it being unfairly scrutinized. Part 3. Why Critical Race Theory is Not Being Taught in Schools Schools are not teaching critical race theory, so its opponents can take a breath here. I've seen interviews where alarmists claim that CRT is in every school classroom as early as third grade, and that is a pants on fire lie. I've seen people argue that school boards are sneaking critical race theory into curriculum, but that really misunderstands how schools decide what to teach. Here are a few tools you can use to find out what a school teaches about race in your community as long as you live in the U.S. Google your state's name followed by social studies standards and your first result will probably be your state department of education's website for the standards that your state has adopted. They're influenced by national standards but adopted by states individually. So Wyoming's might be a little different from New York's but they'll have a lot of similarities. On this web page will likely be a PDF to the academic standards from K to 12. These PDFs can kind of be hard to wade through because they're incredibly full of text and things like evidence outcomes, and that might mean nothing to people outside the educational field. So here's a little primer. Let's look at what's taught about racism and history in Colorado's high school social studies courses. Now each subject is broken into smaller units of study called standards. For social studies, there are four history, geography, economics, and civics, with economics having the most standards attached to it. For each standard, there are statements about what graduates are supposed to know, skills they should have, and questions to guide inquiry. The only one that really has anything to do with teaching about race is Prepared Graduate Statement 2 on page 101 which says that prepared graduates of high school will be able to analyze historical time periods and patterns of continuity and change through multiple perspectives within and among cultures and societies. The more specific skills listed below that statement call for students to be able to examine complexity of events such as the civil rights movement and immigration, examine and evaluate issues of diversity, evaluate historical development of reform and activist groups, etc. That's as close to critical race theory as it gets. You might think that sounds kind of slanted to the left, but that same standard also asks students to examine issues of national unity, the role of patriotism and religion, the technical innovations like Henry Ford's assembly lines, and how cooperation helps shape our country. Additionally, look at the way each of these outcomes is phrased. They require students to analyze, investigate, examine, and evaluate, not take what teachers say at face value, not to accept one particular point of view, and not to indoctrinate. We would argue that high school history classes still present a pretty pro-American way of thinking. I mean, U.S. schools were not only invented to educate, but also to socialize someone into American society, and despite what the far right has said, they're hardly communist indoctrination camps. After examining state standards, a school district will purchase materials and curricula aligned to those standards. And to be honest, they're probably textbooks from a company in Texas, because they all seem to be. And then the school district gives guidance to individual schools about what to teach. Individual departments will then decide how to teach that material and in what order, giving a little bit of wiggle room for each individual teacher's specific teaching style. This is not a perfect process, and personally I think a lot of those textbooks from Texas are far from ideal, but this is a much more transparent process than the one that opponents of CRT will have you believe is in the works at a school district. There are no shadowy organizations who are putting teachers in their pockets. Most school boards don't even have any hand in deciding what is taught, and if you really want to know what's being taught in your neighborhood school, go to back to school night. 
Request a copy of the required reading list. We'll print you out one. The closest schools might get these days to teaching critical race theory is just the acknowledgement that racism is a part of everyday life. When we were in school, we were largely taught that racism was a conscious act by a mean racist person who didn't look like you, by the way. They were probably some backwoods hillbilly. And what they did to a person of color, like hurling insults or Alabama Governor George Wallace blasting civil rights protesters with fire hoses. Either way, this was something that happened a very long time ago, and Dr. King came along and he fixed racism. I think most teachers would agree that the history curriculum has moved ahead a little bit, beginning to use terms like systemic racism and privilege, but in a far shallower way than adopting critical race theory. But the most important, maybe the real reason why K-12 schools are not teaching critical race theory is the same reason why we're not teaching Cleanth Brooks and post-structuralism or how to sequence the human genome, because it is a university level of study that is not always developmentally appropriate for school age children. In an AP level 11th or 12th grade class, they might approach CRT as one lens the same way that a high school English class might introduce formalism as a way to understand literature, but that is about it. Now we absolutely should be implementing elements of critical race theory into history classrooms, like showing how funding schools with property taxes has disadvantaged majority black schools for a long time. Look, kids know they haven't gotten the full picture in history class. They know that they get a sanitized version of history even in high school, and they're tired of it. Kids have begged me for classes where we talk about the full spectrum of history, good things and the bad. And when you don't give them that, they tune out. Making the history curriculum more honest will help engage students. Part four, what this fight is actually about. The fight about critical race theory in schools isn't about adopting specific teachings in the classroom. It's the latest battlefield on which the culture war is being fought. White supremacy can feel its grasp on the next generation slipping and deploys outright lies, like the speaker we mentioned in the beginning of this video, that critical race theory is designed to destroy families or, you know, that sex traffickers can sell your children into slavery. Just saying out aloud makes me laugh. The fear sounds very similar to what we were told would happen to your family if we allowed gay marriage or marijuana legalization or gangster rap. This is about control. As of June 29th, 2021, 26 U.S. states have introduced bills or taken other measures to not only restrict teaching of critical race theory, but to rein in how much teachers talk about racism or sexism. Some proposals even want teachers to wear body cams in the classroom so they can monitor what they teach. Part 4.5, an addendum. Okay, it's been about two weeks since we shot the rest of this video, but there's some news that we really wanted to include in this video. I got a haircut since then, but I put on the same shirt for continuity's sake. In Texas, the state legislature recently passed Bill SB3, which amends a previous bill about the social studies curriculum called HB3979. Now, the text of that original bill includes a lot of stuff about developing each student's understanding of the American experiment, from things like the Declaration of Independence to the Federalist Papers to the Lincoln-Douglas debates. But Section H2 of that bill also calls for things like studying the Chicano movement, the Civil Rights Movement, the American Labor Movement, and the history of Native Americans. It includes a couple of required texts, such as Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, and the Emancipation Proclamation. It also includes what appears to be the most controversial part of this bill requiring teaching that the history of white supremacy, including but not limited to the institution of slavery, the eugenics movement, and the Ku Klux Klan, and the ways in which it is morally wrong. Basically, anything from that original bill that requires the teaching of civil rights history is gone under SB3. And frankly, I think the best way to illustrate how damningly clear their intentions are here is to just look at a copy of the bill and see everything that is crossed out. It's heartbreaking. Those who are in the news as proponents of this bill are saying things like we shouldn't teach that slavery and white supremacy are intertwined with the founding of America, and that for liberty and justice for all never meant anything less than all people. But they were intertwined, and liberty and justice for all did not mean all people. That's what the Dred Scott decision was about. But when we don't teach history, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that we don't know about that. 
Now, the bill is stalled out right now and requires action by early August, so it's entirely possible that by the time this video comes out, it will already be dead. But I said a second ago that this was about control. So let me say a few more words about that with this new bill in mind. This is about centering the white experience in the classroom so that white history and white progress and white figures are what is taught. If this bill just removed the teaching of the 1619 project as a requirement in schools, I think there's at least an argument to be made there. But I find it almost funny that those who are against CRT will say that it modifies history or that it's a revisionist version of history, all the while shamelessly, literally erasing history. If you'd like to look at the text of the bill yourself, it is linked down below in the video description. Everything we've talked about here starts on page three of that PDF. Now, back to your originally scheduled video. It's clear that people who support bills like that don't trust their neighborhood teachers. And honestly, I'm not trying to indoctrinate your kid into socialism. I don't get paid enough to do that and teach them how to read. In fact, paying us so little, everyone acting like they're our boss and threatening to monitor our every word in the classroom is a great way to make the current teacher shortage way worse. I don't need to work at a place that respects me that little. And honestly, whatever problem you might have with your neighborhood school is much better than when experienced, skilled teachers who are passionate about what they do leave the profession. And then you have inexperienced teachers on emergency licenses without relevant degrees. Now, it's really easy to feel squeezed as an educator these days. Parents want their kids to learn knowledge and skills that will help them in the 21st century. But if you try to take a calculated risk and try something new that is very much for the benefit of your students, oftentimes we're just told to stick to reading, writing, and arithmetic. But just like they've always been, young people are hungry for knowledge, they care deeply about justice, and their minds are very much open. Please, oh please, do not restrict their access to material and conversations that will help them grow. If you want us to stick to diagramming sentences all day, I guess we can do that, but in the end, I'm not trying to teach Shakespeare. I'm trying to teach kids.